lift up the thumbs. Come on, invite your family and friends. Come on in, come on in, y'all. This war is about to drop. I promise you it is. that those of you all that are even at work you're picking your lunch uh break around this time and again i don't take it for granted that you're here and so for that i say thank you uh for that i say thank you from the bottom of my heart i want to uh dive into this message or this word that god has been giving me concerning this thing called friendship and uh and this has been I know I did this. I did a series on friends, I believe, a while ago, but I had to revisit this thing. Today, I want to talk about this thing called friends. 
Nowadays, we use this term so loosely. So to the point that I think that it no longer carries the weight that it should. Never in all of my days have I witnessed and even seen so many friends betray friends. Just a few days ago, you all were rider, they were your rider dies. And the next few days later, they're now your enemy. It's amazing how covenants, agreements were made when things were going good, but the moment you had an indifference, now all of a sudden the dynamics of the relationship has now changed. And before I go any further, let us define the word friends. I am convinced that many of us don't even know the true meaning, let alone the definition of what a friend is. Let's look at what Webster described friends. Webster described friends as this. Webster say a friend is a person who knows and with whom one has a bond of mutual affections, typically exclusive of sexual or family relations. And what's bothering me nowadays that everyone is calling each other friends and don't even know the meaning of a friend. They've never been a friend, always been a person of confusion, but wants to call themselves a friend. I have a problem with that. The Bible records in Proverbs chapter number 18, verse number 24, a man that have a friend must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. What is the writer really saying? Before, hit this now, this is what the writer is really saying. Before a person can be a friend to someone, you have to first understand this thing called loyalty to yourself. Because if you're not loyal to yourself, it's impossible for you to be loyal to anyone else. And, 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 and what's happening is because you can't be true to yourself and, the re and real with yourself, getting around others, you will not be organic because you're not really the real you. Simply because when people, you see people that have a whole lot of friends, in essence, they battle with a strong spirit of loneliness. And in most cases, because people are going through identity crisis, they feel the best way to hide their insecurities is to camouflage it in a group of people. But in essence, they battle with the spirit of isolation, insecurities, antitrust, all because they didn't know who they were and didn't have any soul searching of their own demons. So instead of dealing with their own demons, they'll find fault in others to feel good about themselves and their shortcomings and their demons. And I come to this conclusion, this is the conclusion I come to, that many people will have a group of people surrounding them because they are afraid to see the real them when, they, when they're by themselves. All, all, we all need friends who stick close Listen carefully and often will listen to what we have, especially in bad times and even in good times. But I also come to this conclusion that it's better to have one such friend than to have a dozen of superficial acquaintances, acquaintances that we've given the title of friends to. Many of us, we've given associates the title called friend. And in actuality, they are not even our associates. Some of them are just our comrade. Some of them are just constituents, but we've given them the title of called friend. But could it be the reason why we keep attracting phony people because perhaps we're phony? Let me pause right there. Before, I, before, you, before you log off, I want you to stay right there. So when I speak of this thing called phony, I'm not exactly saying that we're phony or that you're phony, but when I speak of the word phony, I speak in terms of dealing with you, being real with yourself. Because if you can't be real with yourself, who can you be real with? There's nothing worse than being involved in a relationship called toxic. Toxic friendships are negative relationships that make you feel unhappy, unhealthy, unequal, and sometimes threatened. And this is from someone who is supposed to be your friend. Good Lord, y'all stay right there. Let me take my time. I don't want to rush this because I believe some of us are getting ready to identify these jokers that are in our camp today. These type of friends, watch this now. These type of friends, these are what we call toxic friendships. Friends that will stress you out. Friends that will use you. They will wear you down physically. They will wear you down mentally. They will wear you down emotionally. But you call them your BFF. 
How is it that you might be of help? But you're so toxic, you're draining, you never have anything positive to say. Every time I turn around, there's always negativity flowing from your belly or flowing from the lips of your mouth. If we're truthful with ourselves, many of us keep toxic friends in, in our lives for, varieties, for various reasons, but don't realize the impact that these friends can inflict. Let me show you how uh, toxic friends can inflict us. We tend to have a love-hate relationship with these type of friends. A lot of times, when you find yourself in this predicament, you often feel trapped because you don't know how to extricate yourself from the situation. What is extricate? I'm glad you asked. Let's define what extricate is. So in other words, because I understand this thing called loyalty, this is you that's involved in a toxic relationship. Because we understand this thing called uh, loyalty and they don't, we will sometimes lower our standards of being their friend because we don't know how to remove ourselves from them because we feel somewhere down the line that we can help them. But if we be truthful with ourselves, before we met them, they were jacked up. Let me say that again. Before we met toxic people, before we met them, they were already jacked up. And what you and I have to come to the conclusion is, and that is, everyone cannot be helped. In other words, we can't be Jesus to everybody. There are some people, again, the Bible says, Jesus wished that, that all of us wouldn't perish. He wished that all of us would be saved. But the real truth of the matter is Jesus also understands that there are some people that are just not going to get it. Now watch this now. We will constantly complain to other friends. I'm getting ready to show you when you are not in an in a organic relationship or in a relationship that is conducive for your destiny. We will often constantly complain to other friends, relatives, and whomever else that will listen about our difficulties and our indifference in that relationship or even their friendship, which isn't healthy because if we call ourselves their friends, isn't it's our responsibility solely to seek for the help for them and not spread their shortcomings to those who already dislike them. Hmm, let me say, I need to say that one more time. Y'all missed that one. It's not our job or our responsibility to spread seeds of discord about the one that we call friends or their shortcomings, especially when God had already revealed to us who they were. We got to come to the grips that everybody we can't help. There are some people that we call our friends that are not our friends. As a matter of fact, sometimes we got to strip them of that title called friendship. At the same time, we tend to never do anything about it. Again, some of us, we are in what I call walking on cotton friendship. We can't really be who we want to be or need to be in our lives to them because we're afraid they'll snap off. We're afraid they'll cut us off. We're afraid they'll reveal our secrets. So what do we do? We just allow them to be a nemesis to society. We allow them to be who they are, but in actuality, we, we really don't like them. And that's what we call a love-hate relationship. Glory to God. So this is what we do. This is what we do when we're in toxic relationships and even friendships. This is what we do. We won't tell the friend about their behavior because we, we feel like they'll feel a certain kind of way. So instead of telling, telling them how you really feel, you continually, watch this now, you will continually to allow the spirit called emotional abuse to be your measure and your portion. See, again, I often say we that was a lie that was told years ago that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never hurt me. No, no, no. The real truth of the matter is being in toxic relationships is worse than being in a physical relationship because a toxic relationship that's called a, a, a verbal abuse or emotional abuse, they will tear you down. Not only will they tear you down, but they won't build you up. They always a Debbie Downer. They never have anything positive say and before you know it you once was a positive individual and because now they are in your sphere they are not in your circle you no longer have the energy to be who you are because they their, their demonic influence has now superseded or has overpowered your god-given ability to live so the very person watch this now so the very person you see in your friends you find yourself becoming Oh, really God. Let me say that again. So the very person you see in your friends, you find yourself becoming. So your life becomes the movie. Look at this now. 
So your life becomes the movie and you become the star of your own films and your friends are your supporting cast. <laughs> Let me say that again. You become the star of your own movie and your friends become the supporting, pack, su supporting cast. But the fact of the matter is, such toxic personality either don't know how or don't want to change. I come to this conclusion. There are some people that don't want to change. There are some people that don't want to don't want to accept their wrongdoing. They feel like because they've been like this all their life, that's who they are. After all, if being manipulative works for them and they get what they want out of life, why should they change? They feel like I can go around being a Debbie Downer. People will begin to now feed into my energy. People will begin to feed into my, my spirit. And so they, and I begin to now tell them what I want, what I desire. And because they see the spirit of the Debbie Downer on me, guess what happened? Now I get what I want. It's a spirit. It's a subtle spirit. Watch this now of Ahab. It's a subtle spirit. It's a passive aggressive spirit. Because all we want, because the real truth of the matter is all we want, we've all, after all, this is what happened to us. We've grown accustomed to their behavior and it works for the relationship or the friendship. How many of you have ever been in a relationship and a friendship? You know the friendship is toxic. You know the friendship is, is, is ungodly. The friendship is draining. But the real truth of the matter is you find yourself, every time you find yourself saying I'm coming out, you find yourself going deeper involved in their relationship. And you say, man, I know this person is not good for me. I know this person is not good to me, but I can't seem to shake them. And one of the reasons why you can't seem to shake them is because now their spirit has now become your spirit. It's called transferable spirits. Never, hear this now, hear this, I want you to hear this. Never allow someone you say you love to continue to spread toxic throughout the world. I believe it's our responsibility as believers to get people right. You must have a confrontational anointing. If I can get five of y'all just to type in, I must have a confrontational anointing. Five of y'all just type in, I must have a confrontational anointing. Come on, come on, just type that in. I must have a confrontational anointing. Oh, we get ready to go there, y'all. This is a fresh word, I promise you. Fresh word that God gave me. Come on, just type in, I must have a confrontation on anointing. Come on. Come on, just type in, I must have a confrontation on anointing. Come on, keep sending up the thumbs. Come on, come on, send them up. Let me let this window up. Come on, just type in, I must have a confrontational anointing. Come on, just type in, I must have a confrontational anointing. Come on, just type in, I must have a confrontational anointing. About three of y'all just type in, I must have a confrontational anointing. Okay, let me go back. Never allow someone you say you love to continue to spread the toxic throughout the world. You being their friend, you have to at some point deal with your friend's shortcomings, but you have to deal with yours first. Because one of the worst fights to have are those when you're trying to address someone of their shortcomings and you either have the same ones or your situation is worse than theirs. Never ever confront someone about their shortcomings and you have not confronted your own self. Again, we, we read in Proverbs chapter number 18, verse number 24. It said, he that have a friend must first show himself friend. So in other words, you have to first become your not only your own friend, but you have to first also confront your own demons. How it is that you can confront somebody else's demons, but you can't confront yours. And that's what we call, and this is what leads me to my next part. One of the worst friendships to be involved in are selfish ones and one-sided friendships. One of the worst moments in life was when I was in prayer and God began to reveal to me about most of my friends. This is when I had an epiphany. This is when I had a come to Jesus moment. God began to reveal to me while I was in prayer about some of my friends. Again, I'm under this persuasion. I'm not going to be duped in this season. I've been telling God, God began to reveal to me who people are. I don't want to just give people the benefit of the doubt when God is trying to tell me, don't get close to him. He said, Terrence, you have to come to the realization that all friendships are not ordained or sanctioned by me. Say that one more time. 
He said, all friendships are not ordained by me or sanctioned by me. Some friendships we've put together. And because we put them together, this is why we got hurt in the first place. What did the Bible say? The Bible says, lean not to your own understanding. And that even applies to even in building relationships. Bear in mind, not all friends are healthy and not all friendships can be relied upon. The trick is to know what a healthy friendship is and what is not. Just because, hear this now, just because you spend time with someone doesn't give them the title of friends. Just because you talk to someone often doesn't mean that they're your friend. You may be acquaintances, you may be neighbors, you may be church members, you may be co-workers, but not necessarily friends. Too many unhealthy friendships create unhealthy chaoses in our life. Some of us, we're going through some unnecessary chaoses in our life and we're giving people the title friends when in actuality, God says, they're not your friend. They are just your co-worker. You've taken your co-worker to, 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 to sacred, in, uh, sacred, uh, sacred places. You're taking some of your acquaintances in, 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 to, in, in places that you shouldn't have taken them in when in actuality, you gave them that title friend. And because you gave them that title friend, you created your own catastrophe. You created your own chaos. And God says, if you would have been in the spirit, I was trying to show you who they were in the beginning. Too often, people are bad mouthing friends in anger or even in, a, in an effort to gain favor of other friends. You, you, you may undermine a friendship in your effort to be liked or well received by others. Never in all of my days have I seen a bunch of, again, I'm just going to talk about men. I, I can't talk about the women. Never in all of my days have I seen a bunch of catty men that would get around, I, I, I need to, I can't hear, that, uh, that, that, that would get around other men, dog another man out, and then when the other man comes around, you act as if you haven't said nothing about that other man. <laughs> Glory to God. Too often, we have one-sided friendships where one person is always doing for the other, yet the other person seldom return the favor. And too many people are sabotaging the success of the success of other people's friendship that claim to be my friend. True friends, let me talk, let me just talk about true friends. True friends are healthy friendship, are healthy friends and never sabotage. A, a true friend is not gonna talk about you behind your back. As a matter of fact, a true friend ain't going to allow nobody to even to even set up camp, to even start a conversation concerning you. When they say, did you hear about sister so-and-so? No, no, no. We're not going to talk about sister such so-and-so. That sister such so-and-so is my friend. And because I understand this thing called loyalty, we're not getting ready to have this conversation. And if you want to have this conversation about sister so-and-so, let's get sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so in the midst. So whatever you got to say about brother and sister so-and-so, you're going to say in the midst of both him and I. Oh, really, God. That's how you stop the spirit of gossip. That's how you stop the spirit of sabotaging. Healthy friendships are nourishing, not hurtful. You can't tell me you, you're my friend if you're always in a position called hurting me. True friends are not going to hurt you. You may hurt my feelings. You may hurt what I, you, I may not like what you have to say, but you're not going to hurt me. A real friend is going to cover you. A real friend is going to protect you. Even, watch this now, I know this, and I'm going to get to Jonathan and David in a minute. A real friend is not going to allow your enemies to see that there is an indifference in your friendship. Even though you may not understand or may not even like what your friend did, but I'm not going to give my enemies the benefit of the doubt that I got a problem with my BFF or my friend. A true friend, look at this now, a true friend is someone who has your best interest at heart, someone who has your back even when you're not in the same room. Hmm, I'm going to say that one more time. I lost about 10 of you all right there. A true friend is someone who has your best interest at heart, someone who has your back even when you're not in the same room. Why is it? Why is it that you always 
uh, uh, you always telling me, be aware of these kind of people that's always telling me about what somebody said about me when I'm not in their presence, which lets me further know why is it that they're so comfortable talking about me when I'm not in their presence and when you're in their presence and you call yourself my friend, could it be that you have hooked up with the very same people and you're getting in with the people that don't like me, but you call yourself my friend when we're around, but you're my enemy when you're around my enemies. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Let me, let, let me let that pause right there because ain't nobody that's my real friend. Somebody that said they love me. I'm not going to allow nobody to get that comfortable talking about one of my friends to me. If you're my friend, they not going to even have, they not going to even feel comfortable saying something about sister so-and-so. No, no, no. I, I don't even want, when I hear you say, did you hear about, so no, 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 Jim Shoot, this ain't how it go down. I'm loyal. I, it's called death before dishonor. Isn't it amazing that the, the world understands this thing called loyalty more than the church does? My pause right there. It's amazing how the world understands this thing called loyalty more than the church does. Hallelujah. The best of friends, hear this now. Me and, my, me and my best friends, we can have a falling out and it can be to the point that it can seem as if our friendship has come to an end. But because they're my friend and because they have my best interest at heart, they're not going to get off the phone. They're not going to leave my presence and get it in about me, about to somebody that don't like me. I'm talking about a real friend. A real friend will cover you even when you all have uncovered one another. What do I mean by uncovered one another? When you all have had fallen out, when you all have had disagreement, a real friend say, you know what? I understand that we're not seeing eye to eye, but I'm not going to allow the devil to come in and really pull, 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 uh, pull uh, fire on top of fire. That's, a, that's not how it's going. Best of friends have the courage to tell you the truth. Let me say this. Best of friends have the courage to tell you the truth rather than tell you what you want to hear, but does it without brutality. Again, I don't want to be involved in a friendship or relationship with somebody is always stroking my ego. Someone who don't want to tell me the truth because they're afraid of my response. No, no, no. My grandma used to say, tell me the truth, even if it hurts me, then they tell me a lie, then they make me feel good. Don't tell me a lie just because you don't want to, you're afraid of my response. No, tell me the truth. Man, it may cause me, us not to see each other a couple of days. I'm okay with that. But I do not want my friend, I'm talking about my real friend, to tell me a lie. Just because they don't want, they don't want to, uh, they don't want to have this thing called confrontation. Most real friendships, most organic friendships does have indifferences. Most real friendships has bad days. I don't need to talk to you every day to, for you to define yourself as my best friend. I don't need to define you as my best friend if we if, if we don't go to every convocation together. No, 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 no. Listen, I got my life, you got yours. That does not define our friendship. Glory to God. Again, I want a friend that knows how to pick me up. I can be in New Jersey. They can be in Antarctica. But they pick me up in the spirit and they call me. Say, I want to pray for you. There's something going on. I, I feel I picked you up in my spirit. I'm talking about a real friend. A real friend, watch this now. A real friend has, and I know I'm getting ready to mess some of you religious folk up. A real friend has a part of them or part of you in them. Get ready to show you in Jonathan and David. I'm talking about soul ties. I'm talking about godly soul ties. The best of friends, the best of friends, understands this thing called soul ties. There are godly soul. There are some people. There are some friendships that God has put together. There are some relationships that God has put together. Then there are some friendships and relationships that you put together. And you said, man, how in the hell can I come out of that thing? I'm getting ready to show you how you come out. But I want to. I want to. I want to take my time with this. The best of friends don't put you down, either to your face or behind your back. I want to go back to that. The best of friends do not put you down, either to your face or behind your back. Friends refuse to join in a gossip column session about you. Instead, a real friend will fight for you in the heat of rumors and in little indiosis. A real friend is not going to allow people to get it in about you. 
They don't leverage your friendship in an effort to gain a new one. You got some people that will leverage your friendship in an effort to gain a new friendship. When it comes to finding friends, perhaps the first step is understanding what exactly is this friendship all about. Does it mean you have to have, do we have to be on the same Facebook page or anything like that? I'm talking about a real friend. Listen, a real friend, I don't need to talk to a real friend 24-7. I don't need to talk to a real friend. You don't have to come over my house once a week. I'm talking about a real friend. A real friend picks me up. Watch this now. A real friend picks me up first in the spirit. Mm. Let me pause right there. A real friend picks me up first in the spirit. A real friend picks you up first in the spirit. I'm talking about a godly relationship. A real friend can know when you're having a bad day. If I'm around someone and I don't pick up that they don't have a bad day, and you've been around me any length of time and I'm having a bad day. And even though I'm, 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 I got a facade on my face and you can't pick that up, you haven't studied me. You don't know what's going on. A real friend study their friends. They know when they're having a good day. They know when they're having a bad day. I'm talking about a real friend. I'm not talking about somebody we're going out to eat with. That's not my friend. You just my buffet buddy. I'm not talking about somebody who, 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 who we go to shopping together. You're just my shopping buddy. I'm talking about somebody who can pick me up in the spirit that can say, man, I picked you up. Something is going on. The Holy Spirit dropped you in my spirit early this morning at 543 and something wasn't right. I'm talking about a real friend, a real friend. I'm talking about a real friend, a real friend. However, people have bad days. Again, we have bad days and we certainly do. None of us are perfect. So even when you're having a bad day, a real friend is going to pick you up. Let me just drop this on you. Someone just type in 1 Samuel chapter number 19. Someone just type in 1 Samuel chapter number 19. We're getting ready to define what a real friend is. I'm getting ready to show you. When you a real friend, I'm getting ready to give you a test. Do you look forward to seeing your friend? How do you feel when you are with this person? Do you feel like you can share your most intimate secrets with this person? Can you be joyful around this person? Or do you have to cur curtail some of your things? Friends, I'm talking about real friends. Real friends don't keep score. There is a balance. A real friend, I ain't gonna, I paid the last bill. You pay this bill. No, no, real friends, we don't keep score. I got you. Real friends say, hey man, I'm gonna fund this whole thing. Another real friend said, you know what? I'm going to fund this other thing. Real friend said, man, I got you. Let, let, let's do this. Real friends, we don't, we don't keep score. There's a balanced friendship. Sometimes one friend may be on the spotlight. Again, a real friend is not jealous of their other friend. Look, it may be your day on the spotlight in the limelight today. It's going to be mine tomorrow. But while it's your time and while it's your day, I'm going to celebrate you. I'm going to push you. I'm going to do what I got to do to make you look good. Because I understand this one thing, that if my real friend blow up, guess what? He understands I'm coming with him too. That's what I'm talking about, a real friend. Real friendship is not jealous ones. First Samuel chapter number 19. Let's exegete the text. Let's go back again. Let me just, let me just work up the text. In First Samuel chapter number 18, the Bible speaks about... How Samuel, I mean, how, how Jonathan had met David. They had just met. I'm just going to just read the first verse of chapter number 18. Then we're going to go back to verse number 19. Look what it says. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan, which is Saul's son, was knitted with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. That's what we talk about, a God friendship, soulmates. So the Bible says that when David met Jonathan and when Jonathan met David, their souls became knitted. They so knitted to the point that in verse number two, and Saul took him that day and would let him no more go home to his father. So to the point that David was tending to sheep dome. David was a shepherd boy. David was out in the field. He had one of the worst jobs in the world. But the Bible says that Jonathan loved David so to the point that David, that Jonathan, who, who was a royal child, he now exchanged his garments and give his royal garments to David. And he makes an exchange. He says, David, I want you to look, I want you to smell good. I want you to look good because I now understand this one thing that if you're my friend, you may have less than now. So whatever I have, you have. A real friend 
covers you. A real friend has your back. A real friend is not going to allow you to look raggedy. You, they got on Sean John. They got on uh, 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 They got on the best of gear. And you walking around here in, 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 in pro wings. You walking around here in ponies. And you got on the, you got on, you got on, you got on red bottoms. And here it is. I got, I got on cardboards at the bottom of my shoe. A real friend said, you know what? Because I have access to greater things, I'm going to make an exchange. I'm going to give you what I got. And I'm going to make sure that you look good. See, I'm, I'm tired of one-sided friendship, one-sided relationship. You looking good because you know that I look good naturally, but because you look good materialistically, you want to look good and make me look bad because you're afraid of me to shine. If you got those kind of friendships that don't want to pull you up while you down, you better run. Run from those friends that see you have a need and they got the means to help you and won't help you. Run from those people. Those are what you call toxic relationships, one-sided relationships. I, I go to you and you know my need. You know my struggles. You know I got situations going on. You have the needs to help me. You have the means to help me, but you won't help me because you're afraid that if I blow up, I'm going to forget about you. Boo-boo, you don't really know who I am because I understand that, that if I blow up, you blow up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I may not have right now, but guess what? When I get it, you got it. But since I got it, you get it. That's what I'm talking about, a real friend. So that's what Jonathan Jonathan did for David. He says, David, I want to introduce you to my dad. You, you got you got you got siblings. You got you got nine brothers and, and you, you got nine brothers and a sister. And and here it is. They forgetting about you. And, and, and Samuel came in and told you that you were the one. And they forgotten about you. I want to help accelerate your date with destiny. That's what Jonathan did. Jonathan accelerated David's destiny because he understood that if he stayed in his daddy's house, Jesse, he was going to always be overlooked. See, a real friend can see the oil on your life. And because a real friend see the oil on your life, they're going to do whatever they have to do to accelerate your date with destiny. Because Jonathan under, oh, I feel the presence of God. Because Jonathan understood that, that if, when David blow up, David got me. That even if David don't get me, I'm still going to be good because guess what? I see the oil of God that's on my friend's life and because I see the oil of God on my friend's life, I want to be a vehicle for him to get to where he needs to get to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look what he says. And Jonathan and David made a covenant. Somebody just type in made a covenant. Come on. I just need you to just type in covenant. Just type the word in covenant. Come on. We're getting ready to define this word covenant. Come on. Somebody just type in the word covenant. Somebody just type in covenant. Come on. Type in covenant. Come on, come on, just type in the word covenant. C-O-V-E-N-A-N-T. Come on, somebody just type in the word covenant. C-O-V-E-N-A-N-T, covenant. Come on, covenant, come on. We're going to learn this word covenant, come on. Jonathan understood this thing called covenant. He made a covenant. He just, covenant is, he says, our friendship will never be broken. I'm not going to allow nothing. I'm not going to allow money. I'm not going to allow family. I'm not going to allow friends. I'm not going to allow church folk. I'm not going to allow nothing to come in between our covenant. See, a lot of us, we made covenants, but we broken covenant. We made covenant, but we broke covenant. Many of us, we've given people our word. Never ever give someone, someone your word and never keep it. When you give someone your word and you don't keep it, what you call, you call a truce breaker. You call a covenant breaker. Never ever say, I'm going to do something and don't do it. Again, the days of doing things with good intentions are over with. Never say, I'm, I had good intentions, especially when you have good intentions all the time and your good intentions never come into manifestation. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So David, so then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved them as his own soul. Taught my soulmate, his soul brother. He said, he, and Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was upon him. Again, I'm talking about covenant. Is action, not talk. Covenant is action, not talk. Covenant is action, not talk. So he made a covenant. He stripped him. So this is what he do. He now comes out of his royal garment, stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garment and even his sword. He says, David, I'm not going to only give you my clothing, but I'm going to give you something to fight with. I'm going to let you know you ain't in this fight by yourself. David, I got your back, dog. You, I'm get, not only am I going to give you my garments, but I'm going to give you something to fight with. See, a real friend is going to make sure you're protected. A real friend is going to make sure that the wolves don't get you. A real friend is going to make sure you got something to fight with. Glory to God. And look what he says. He said, and to the, and to the bow and to his girdle. Look at verse number five. And this is where 
the spirit of jealousy comes in. Rokotama. This is what comes in. So here it is. Now Saul becomes jealous of David. Now you have to remember, David didn't have anything. Isn't it amazing that, that people, let me bless you all. I'm getting ready to go on the prophetic wings of imagination. Isn't it amazing how people can see the anointing on your life and you can't even see it? Cobra to God. Isn't it amazing how people can see the oil of God on your life and you can't even see it? David, only agenda was, I just want to be a servant. David's only agenda was, Jonathan is my friend. Whatever you have me to do, Saul, I'm willing to do it. I got no other, other agenda. But you got to be very careful of people that see the God in you and on you and they become jealous. Be very leery of people that says, girl, you doing it like that? You ain't even doing it yet. They may say it in a jokingly manner, but there's an undertone to, their, to what they're saying. They saying, in other words, I got to do it better than you. See, some people, hear this now, some people don't mind you doing good, but as long as you're not doing better than they are. Let me say that again. Some people don't mind you being good or doing good as long as you're not doing it better than they are. But there was not a jealous bone in David's, I mean, in Jonathan's, in Jonathan's sphere. Jonathan was not jealous of David. He says, David, man, whatever I got, you got. Man, I ain't jealous of you, man. Listen, here. if you got a house, man, if I got means to help you get a house and you live in an apartment, I'm going to help you. I'm talking about a real friend. I ain't talking about somebody that's always taken. You got people that's always taken from you. They never given. They always borrowing from you, but they never given. They always take, 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 never give, give, give. Man, when is the relationship going to be reciprocated? When is the relationship going to be a balanced friendship? Be careful, be careful of those kind of people that never ever give you anything. Knowing they got it, but they won't give it to you because they feel like the little that they got and they give it to you, that you're going to accelerate quicker than them. Do you not understand, fool, that if your person that you sow into, if they got the right spirit, and if you sow into their spirit or into what they have, they going to bless you too when they blow up? But it's called a crab mentality. They don't want to see you prosper. They don't want to see you advance. It's okay to be number two for a season. Hey, let me say that again. It's okay to be number two for a season because when your season come, there's room for the top for all of us. Look what he says. Look at this. Look what he says. Look at this now. I'm getting ready to bless you. This is where the spirit of jealousy come in. The spirit of jealousy now comes on Saul. You have to remember, now, now Saul has no reason to become jealous of David. None whatsoever. You have to know Saul is the king. So here it is. You got access to everything, and you're going you're gonna to be jealous of him. As a matter of fact, the clothing that I got on right now, Saul, is from your son. So I ain't got, I ain't got a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of. Excuse me, those of y'all that got a kind of, different kind of ears, don't do me like the other prophet and, and make my thing go viral. I, and he says, I ain't got nothing, and what I got, you just gave it to me. And, you, and, and, and now, Saul, you want to become jealous of me? Why are you becoming jealous? Again, people can see God, what God is getting ready to do on your life quicker than you can see it. And one of the reasons why they can see it quicker than you can see it is because you understand this thing called humility. You understand that, man, I'm not trying to be in the Lamb's life. I understand this thing. I'm not trying to be big before my time. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be something prematurely. You understand that thing. You understand that thing. And because you understand that thing, guess what? I'm going to walk with a spirit of humility. But then there are some people that see the oil of God on your life. And because they see the oil of God on your life, they become jealous because they said, oh, uh oh, here come Terrence. He about to blow up. He's about to hit the word network. Here come Terrence. He about to, he about to, he just, he had TDH as his initial. He about to do this thing. So I got to do with this thing called sabotage. I got to bring up his past. I got to bring up his shortcomings. I got to bring up what he did on yesterday. I got to make it seem like it's relevant for today. They try, they're trying to bring up, be careful of people that try to bring up your past to try to make it seem, to try to make it seem as if your past is your present. Hallelujah. What's going on, Jay Stone? Be careful of those kind of people that, that, that always want to have a remember when. I remember when. I remember when. Man, you have a remember when too, boo-boo. Be careful of those people because guess what? They, when people have a spirit of remember when, always trying to inflict the spirit of remember when. In other words, we're trying to say, 
I'm, I don't, I'm gonna do whatever I gotta do to keep you down. I'm gonna keep your past forever before you. Be careful of those people. Look at this now. Look at this. I'm getting ready to bless you. I'm getting ready to bless you. Don't move. I tell y'all, invite some more people in. This thing's about to drop like a like a like a ballistic missile. Come on, come on. Invite them in. Invite them in. Come on. Invite your people in. While you're watching, you need to invite some people in. This thing's about to drop for real, for real. So this is where Saul becomes jealous of David. Now keep in the subconscious of your mind. David ain't got nothing. He ain't got a he ain't got a pot or a window to throw it out. He don't even have his own clothing. He came in raggedy. But, he's, but, but, but Saul saw the oil of God on his life. He saw the anointing on his life. People see the anointing on your life. And you can't make no apologies for the oil that's on your life. You can't make no apologies. When you start apologizing for the oil and the anointing of God that's on your life, this is what God will do in certain situations. When you start making apologies for the oil and the God that's on your life, God will sometimes strip you. You have to remember, you've already been stripped. You've already been through the storm. You've already been through persecution. You've already been through hell and high water. And now God is accelerating you. Now God is elevating you, accelerating you. And now you want to go back to a place called low self-esteem. Now you want to go back to a place called no confidence. Come on, for real. You done lived in a hotel. You done lived in your car before. And now that God, done, you done lived in a basement with one bathroom. You done, with all you and your kids and your spouse. You done been there. And now that God is, I feel the presence of God. Now God has blessed you. And now you let some jokers that ain't never tried to advance in their life. Always want to remain where they are. And now you want to make an apology for God blessing you. Why they do that at? I'm going to make an apology for what God is. You don't know the hell that I've been through. You don't know how many times I had to eat Roman noodles and act as if it was steak. You don't know how many times I had to go out there and crush cans. You don't know how many times I had to go out there and get a paper route. And now that God has blessed me, now I need to apologize? Hallelujah. Now you want me to apologize for the blessings of the Lord. You want me to apologize for the spirit of Issachar that's upon my life now. Now you want me to apologize. Now I'm in my season called reward. Now you want me to apologize. Now I'm no longer, I'm no longer robbing Peter to pay Paul. All of my needs are met. Now you want me to apologize. Because you, because you want to stay where you were. You want to stay where you were. You want to stay where you were. And because I made a decision to get up and do something about my date with destiny. And now you got a problem with that? Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited. Come on. I need y'all to tag somebody because this thing's about to drop. Come on. I need you to tag. Come on. This thing's about to drop. You want me to pop? Never make an apology for you coming up. What did my boy say? I started from the bottom. Now I'm here. And listen, I've been down too long. I, I've, been in, I've been in a cave of a doodle too long. I, I, listen, nobody knew all the hell that I've been through. No, no, nobody knew how many times I had to, I had to, I had to take from Calm Ed to make sure that the water bill was paid. I had to take from this person and take from that person. I had to make arrangements for this and make arrangements for that. And, and now that I'm coming up and now you want to say that I'm arrogant? No, 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 boo-boo. Where were you when I, when, when, when I was in my pit? Where were you when I didn't have no food to eat? Where were you when I had to piece a meal together? Where were you when I was going through hell and high water? Where were you? Where were you? Where were you? And now you want to judge me now that God has blessed me. And I don't want nothing. All I want to do is I just want God to use me. That's all David said. I just want to, I just want to be in a position for God to use me. I just want to be in a place now. Now God is now. I'm in your camp, uh, Saul. David says, I'm here with you. I live under your roof. You can put me out whenever you get ready. And you have the nerve to get mad. Never ever make no apologies for what God is getting ready to take you. Uh. Never make no apologies. This is a season called Issachar. God has reward. This is a season called Issachar. This is a season called Issachar. God has reward us. God has reward us. After I went through the season of Judah, a praise, now I'm getting ready to get my reward. This is a season where God is about to reward me. This is a season where, where all of the hell that I've gone through, all of the struggles I've been through, all the letdowns, all the disappointments, all the rejection, all the betrayal, all, all, all of the lies that's been told on me. This is a season where I'm about to blow up and I refuse to allow the enemy to sabotage my date with destiny. I refuse to allow the enemy to make me feel like uh, that I got a spirit of pride on me. No, 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 boo-boo. I ain't got a spirit of pride. I got confidence. I'm not know who I 
I am. And I now know who I am. I now know that I can soar. I now know that I'm the head and not the tail. I now know that I'm the lender and not the borrower. I now know that I'm blessed coming and I'm blessed going. See, that was a season. I did not know that. And now that I know that I know and know who I am, and you want to try to dictate to me who I am? Silly rabbit. This ain't, these aren't the problems you want. Look what he says. Look what he says. Look what he says. Cool. Look what he says. In verse number five, all right, we gonna we gonna get to we gonna get to verse number. We gonna get to chapter nineteen. But I got to exegete the text. So 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 now Saul becomes jealous. Don't have a reason. People don't even have a reason to be jealous. You didn't gave them the shirt off your back. You didn't gave them your bill money. Your, your bills are paid, but you didn't gave them your bill money. And they got to know to get jealous because now they see God blessing you. And, and, and you and, and, and there was a season. There was a time when you when you were the doorkeeper. And now God has prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies. God says, I'm preparing a table for you, the presence of your enemy. He says, I'm preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. He says, I'm preparing a table He says, I'm preparing a table for you in the presence of your enemies. He says, I have prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemy. All that you've gone through, here comes joy. All that you've gone through, here comes the big payback. This is a season called restitution. But look what's going on. So now Saul becomes jealous of David. Verse number five. Let me hurry up. Walk this dog. Look what he says. And David went out to whithersoever. Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war. So now, look what Saul does. Saul is jealous, but he's now, look at this now. I'm getting ready to bless you. Let me exegete this text, y'all. This is Bible study 101. So now this is what Saul does. Saul promotes David to be the captain. Look at this. He promotes him to be the captain. But you have to remember that they are in a place called war. So Saul's agenda of promoting David is really to try to kill him. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Saul's real position. Look at this now. Saul's real position of promoting David. It wasn't pure. You have to be very careful of people that's only walking with you only to get to only to know the secrets of your life. People are only walking close to you to only find out what makes you tick. Some people, are, their motives are not pure. They want to know how did you get your anointing. They want to know how did you get to where you got to. Listen, I went through hell to get to where I'm getting to. I had to go through some ridicule season. I had to go through some rejection. I had to go through some lying on. I had to go through some family members turning their back on me. I had to go through, man, I had to, my, my furniture and everything is on a curve. People are having, they having a, 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 a real estate sale on, on my behalf because I've been, I've been, I've been ejected. I've been, I've been, I've been evicted. And now that God has blessed me and now you got a problem with that. Come on now. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know all the hell that I've gone through. And, and, and so, so Saul now is, has a subtle spirit. So he now becomes subtle. I just want to just tell about five of y'all. This is what I just heard God say. God said, for those of you all that's gone through anything or that's going through anything right now, I heard God say, tell them that the season of embarrassment is coming to an end. Hey, hey, Ruko Tamai. God, I feel your presence. God, I feel your presence. I just heard God say, he says, tell about five people that the season of embarrassment is coming to an end. Come on, come on. I just heard God say this. I just heard God say this. God said, Terrence, tell about five people that the season of embarrassment is coming to an end. You may have lost your job. You may have lost your house. You may have lost your car. You may have lost your friends. You may have lost some things that were vitally important. But I just heard the Spirit of God say that everything that you lost, I hear God say you're about to recover all. Hello, David. He says you're about to recover all. People that laughed at you, I hear God say you got the last laugh. God said, you got the last laugh. You got the last laugh. He says, you because you took it like a champ, because you kept on praising me, because you kept on worshiping me, because you kept on doing what you're supposed to do, what you knew to do good, because you kept going to church, because you kept doing what God told you to do. God said, this is a season called the big payback. Hallelujah. I said, this is a season called the payback. Pay you, you, you'd you have had some key people leave your life. You'd have had some family members reject you. You'd have had some people that you thought that would never leave you. you had some people that said they'd never leave you only to find out they'd become your worst enemy. But God says, I'm getting ready to replace all of that. God says, I'm getting ready to replace all of that. I hear God saying, I'm getting ready to replace all of that. I'm getting ready to replace all of that, says the spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. I feel this prophetic dropping. I feel like prophesying. I'm trying to keep my composure. But I feel this prophetic is just dropping real strong. So this is what's going on. So, so, so now, so now Saul, so now Saul, so now Saul is trying to set David up for failure. See, see, some people don't realize they try to set you up for failure and don't realize they set you up for promotion. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here, what did David say? I keep telling y'all, David is my main man. David said, oh, David said, it was good that I was afflicted. It was good that I was ridiculed. It was good that people lied on me. It was good that I found out who the Negroes were. It was good that I found out that you couldn't go to the top with me. I found out that when we was on ground level zero, that you really show who you really were. It was good that I was afraid. It didn't feel good, but I hear God say, it didn't feel good, but it's working for your good. Hallelujah. He says, but it's working for your good. You had some people that you, that people that lied and said, man, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help build you. I'm going to help build this ministry. Let me speak to the leaders. You had some people that said, I'm going to help build this ministry. And the moment you decide to make some changes, they up and leave. But I hear God said, for everyone that left, God said, I'm getting ready to send 15 more. God said, this is the reason why I'm getting ready to blow you up. He said, because I'm not getting ready to allow your enemies to laugh at you. He said, the reason why I'm getting ready to blow you up, because I'm getting ready to make a believer out of those that left prematurely. And I hear God saying, this is your bounce back season. So David, so here it is. I'm trying to keep my composure, but I feel the presence of God. I feel, I feel God stretching out. I feel him. I feel him. I feel him. Glory to God. So, 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 so now Saul promotes David. His only real reason to promote him is to destroy him. His only real reason was to destroy him. Jeremiah, I feel them tongues in, 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 I feel them tongues, man. He says, uh, he says, I, I feel what you're going through. He says, I'm, I'm getting ready to destroy him. I, I got to destroy you because I, uh, uh, I feel threatened. And David said, Saul, how you going to feel threatened about me? I ain't got nothing. I ain't got two nickels to rub together. I'm living in your, I'm living in your palace and you become jealous of me. Look what's going on. Look what he says. He says this. Come on, I need y'all to share this, y'all. This thing is dropping, y'all. Share this, share this, share this right now. Come on, invite some people in because this thing is about to drop. So look what he said. And Saul sent them over to the men of war. This was a special group. And he was accepted in the sight of all people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. Look at what he says in verse number six. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel. Look at this now. David is only doing what he's supposed to do, what he was assigned to do. David is only doing what he's assigned to do. David tells Saul, I don't want none of them problems. I'm just doing what you told me to do. You made me the captain over this. I'm doing a slot. I'm killing, I'm killing what you need me to kill. I'm destroying things which you need to be destroyed. I'm doing it. So in other words, what Saul meant for David's destruction, God is getting ready to flip the script and turn it around for his construction. So look what's going on. He says, and the, and the women, he go, these old catty women, be very careful of a group of people that's trying to get you to go against, that's trying to cause a spirit of division. The catty women, they get together. Bunch of catty women get together. So this is where Saul becomes jealous. Never ever allow the spirit of competition to hit the ministry. And I hear God saying the spirit of competition is getting ready to come down out of the ministry. It's not about who has the, the most members. It's about am I advancing the kingdom? Am I doing what God has called me to do? This is what's going on. And it came to pass. Look at this. The women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy and with instruments. Look at this. because of the, They celebrate because of the victory. And this is what's going on in verse number seven. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain thousands and David slain ten thousands. And Saul was very angry. Now you have to remember, keeping the subconscious of your mind, David does not have nothing to work with. Keep that in the subconscious of your mind. They, remember, Saul promoted him. Again, sometimes people will promote you to see you fail. But God says, even, God says I will even allow your enemies to promote you. I will allow those that don't even like you to promote you. Sometimes people will promote you to see you fail. But I hear God saying what they don't realize. God says, I allow them to promote you to let you know that you're going to do a better job than them. He says, don't walk off just yet. He says, don't throw in the towel just yet. God says, hey, God says, I'm about to make your name great. I ain't, not your title. God says, I'm about to make your name great in the presence of those that want to see you fail. In the presence of those that, that that's plotting your own demise. And so Saul is trying to plot David's demise. He's trying to kill him in war. But he don't understand that David is a man of war. David understand this thing called war. David understand this thing called war. Tasha, David understand this thing. David says, man, man, you got to be crazy. I got the greater one inside of me. I got the greater one working. If, 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 he said, if, if we can slay a thousand, if one can slay a thousand, two can slay ten thousand. David, 
understood this thing. I got this, boo-boo. David says, man, I ain't tripping. What you think? I, all I want to be is a servant. And the greatest person, I hear, I hear God say, the greatest person that God said, God said the greatest person that I want to use in this season. He says, I love apostles, I love prophets, I love events, I love teachers, I love the five folk. But God says the greatest miracles are about to come are those that are sitting in the pews. He says, I'm getting ready to use those that I understand this thing called humility. Those that are jockeying for positions. Those that have been faithful. Those that have been consistent. Those that understand this thing. He says, I'm getting ready to use them. David says, the only thing that I want, I just want to be used. I don't want no title. I don't want to be king. He says, and those of you all that are watching me, God's getting ready to use... God's getting ready to use you all to lay hands on the sick. They're getting ready to recover. You can ready to go to the hospital for family members. They're going to be sick. But the person that's sitting next to the family member that you're going to visit, they got three hours to live and God's going to use your anointed hands to lay hands on them. They're going to recover and they're going to live. God said, because you understand this thing called humility, David says, I'm, I, I don't want these problems. David says, I don't want these problems. He says, he says, he says, and Saul was very angry saying this, and, and, and saying he was displeased. And he said, they have ascribed unto David's 10,000. They have ascribed unto David's 10,000. And to me, they have ascribed but thousands. He go, these catty women. Be very careful of these cat, of catty people in your life. That's always want to uh, cause a vision in the church. Oh, you see what sister so-and-so is doing? You ain't doing nothing. You got you, you more anointed than sister so-and-so. How it is that sister so-and-so, how she praying it? And you can you done went to intercessory class. You got degrees, a theologian degrees. And God says, no, no, never, ever allow titles. Don't never, ever allow a position to get the best of you because you'll miss it in this season. You'll set yourself back 10 years worried about a title. God says, I'm using servants. God says, I'm using folk that understand this thing called humility. I'm using folk that understand this thing called consistency. He said, those are the ones I'm using. He said, those are the ones I'm using. Look what he says. He says, he says, and, and he says, and, and David 10,000. And to me, they have ascribed to thousand. But what have he have more of the kingdom? So now David, now Saul is comparing who he is to David. Remember, David has nothing. David has nothing. Hear what I'm telling you. David has nothing. Verse number nine. And Saul eyed David from that day and forward him. And forward. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying this. This is what's going on. Pastor Brina. This is what's going on. Now, because Saul is more concerned about what people has to say. Now he's missing out on his date with destiny. This is where Saul forfeits his destiny because he took his eyes off of why God called him. Most of you all are out of place right now, says the spirit of the living God, because you start focusing on people versus the assignment that God called you to. Hmm. I'm going to say that again. Most of you all start focusing on people versus the assignment that God called you to. God says, I never told you to focus on the people. He said, I told you to focus on, do the best thing that I called you to do. And because you started focusing on what they were doing, you lost sight on what God was getting ready to do in your life. Look at what he says. In verse number 10, my God, I feel the presence of God. And it came to pass on tomorrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house. Now look at this. Now God allowed, uh, he, 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 again, Saul wasn't prophesying by the spirit of God, but rather from the power of demonic spirits. So look at what's going on. And David played with his hand. And as other times, played with the heart. In other words, he played with his heart. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. Look at what's going on. Now Saul becomes jealous of David. Again, David motives were pure. He only did what he was assigned to do, and he did it great. Some of you all are years behind your time because God has given you an assignment, but because you start looking at another man's vineyard and start looking at what they were doing, you thought that what they were doing was greater than what you were doing, and now the spirit of jealousy now hit you. And because now you're focused on what another man is doing, what God was getting ready to do in your life in in three days is now taking three years, all because you took your eyes off of the assignment that God has called you to do. And because you took your eyes off the assignment, yes, look at this now. Yes, they may were praying. Yes, they may were singing, leading worship. And you probably was back there ushering. You probably was back there uh, 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 cleaning toilets. 
But look at David as our perfect example. God says, I have the ability to cause you to come from the back to the front. But you move posture. You moved because of spirit of distraction. You moved because you felt like, oh, they're not going to use me. No, 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 boo-boo. God says, I'm working at your, God says, I'm looking at your heart. I'm checking to see if your motives are pure. I want to make sure that whenever I blow you up, that you'll never become arrogant, that you'll never ever forget about me, that you'll never think that, that the oil that's on your life is you. Never ever look at any position and say that's beneath you. Look what he says. Look what he says. And, and, and verse number 11, and Saul cast the javelin. For he said, I will kill you, David. Even to the even I, I'll kill you and put this javelin through your heart. And David avoided his presence twice. Look at this. I know some of y'all said, well, he went off from friends. You know, give me to show you. David understood this thing. David said, even though, hmm, even though I know Saul is trying to destroy me, David says, I have every right to destroy him. But David says, I can't destroy him even though he's trying to kill me. Because David says, I can't get promoted until Saul leaves the scene. I'm not going to even kill him. See, some of y'all have moved. Some of y'all are allowing what's going on to cause you to miss God. I'm seeing even in my own ministry. I'm going to prophesy to people in my ministry. Some of you all have allowed the spirit of distraction to hit you. God was getting ready to do something great. But you allow the spirit of distraction again. And they can watch this now. And, and let me just say this. And your distractions could be can be can be solid. There's solidarity to your to, to what you're saying. But God says, I'm looking for a press. God says, I'm looking at how bad do you want it? God says, I'm looking at, how, again, the one with the issue of blood, she could have said, well, you know what? I'm getting ready to fold up. I've been bleeding for 12 years. But she understood, I'm getting ready to encounter Jesus. She understood, I'm getting ready to encounter Jesus. She understood, I'm getting ready to encounter Jesus. And because she understood, she getting ready to encounter Jesus. What she went through in 12 years, she was healed in one day. Mm. <laughs> what she went through in 12 years, one encounter with Jesus healed her. This is why I hear God saying, not only for another chance ministries, God said, there's a blessing in your pressing. God says, some of you are at the tip of your breakthrough. You at the tip of everything that you've been believing me for. God said, you are at the tip of it. Don't allow what you are going through to cause you to miss out on where God is getting ready to take you to. Hey, Hallelujah. David understood this. David says, this ain't even about Saul right now. You know what David really said? He said, my sacrifice is not even about Saul. He said, my sacrifice, the real truth of the matter, is for the generations that are coming behind me. So David understood this. David says, man, this is not even about me. It's not even, because even, okay, this was Saul, but this is for you all too. Even though the enemy wants to kill you, he can't kill you even if he wanted to. The devil can't stop what God has ordained, but you can delay what God has because of the spirit called slowfulness, because of the spirit called lackadaisical, because of the spirit call of, uh, of excuses. God said, rid yourself of excuses. God says, come on back in. Come all the way in. God says, come all the way back in. So David understood this thing is bigger than me. David understood this thing is bigger than me. David says, I can kill Saul. This, the man has told me. David said, a man told me he want to kill me. And God says, I'm not going to allow your enemies to kill you. He says, it's not going to happen. Not on my watch. Look what he says. And Saul was afraid of David. Now, look at this now. And Saul cast his javelin. Now, look at this now. Now, Saul is in control. But now Saul, watch this now. Saul is in control. But now he becomes afraid of David. You don't even realize that your enemies are afraid of you. You are afraid of your enemies, but don't, don't even realize that your enemies are afraid of you. You don't even realize the oil that's on. You got bear, you got bear, you got bear killing demons. I mean, uh, 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 anointing on you. You got, you got, you got Goliath killing anointing on you. You got that kind of anointing on you, but you're afraid because of your enemy, because they look bigger than you, because they outnumber you. But I hear God saying, if you repent and say, God, I'm getting ready to get back in my rightful place. 
God says, everything that you've been believing me for, I'll give it back to you. God says, I'll give it back to you. I've just been wanting for you to humble yourself and recognize that the excuses that you've been giving me, they're not legitimate, says the spirit of the living God. This is what God is saying, and I'm closing. God says, and God says to Saul, he says, therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand. So look what's going on. So now Saul understands the only way that I'm going to get David, the only way I'm going to kill David, I got to kill him in the midst of war. But what he didn't realize, that God was on his side. What he didn't realize, there you go, Dari. What he didn't realize is that God was on his side. Some of us, we're looking for conveniency. Oh, now I just heard God say this. I just heard God. Some of us, we're looking for conveniency to do ministry. But where did God call you? You said, man, Pastor T, you moved to the west side. God didn't call me to the west side. No, but you said God called you to, God, God called you, uh, God called me, you to me. Elijah understood this thing, that wherever Elijah went, I'm going. He said, if you go to Jericho, go to Jordan, I'm going with him. Some of us, we allow a, we allow a place to cause us to miss out on our date with destiny. Don't allow a place to cause you to miss out on your date with destiny. Elijah says, wherever he go, I'm going. Ruth told Naomi, wherever you go, I'm going. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. It's not about a location. The woman with the issue of blood, the Bible says she pressed. Hey, my show about The Bible says she pressed. You have to remember there were thousands of people that were in the vicinity of Jesus. There were thousands of people that were in the vicinity. But it was something about this woman's press. It was something about her touch. The disciples told Jesus, man, many people are touching. You know, Jesus said, something about this touch. Jesus said, there's something about this touch. He said, something about this touch. How bad do you want it? Rid yourself of the excuses. Could it be the reason why you are in a season called barely making it? It's because you got God in a, you got God hands tied. Because you don't want to press. God said, rid yourself of excuses. God said, I'm trying to cause you to go to your next level. I'm trying to cause you to go. But I need to see, what are you willing to sacrifice? Hello, Abram. The Bible says Abram was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son, Isaac. But the Bible says, when he got to Mount Moriah, hey, I feel the presence of God. The Bible says, when he got to Mount Moriah, he was getting ready to kill his son. The Bible says he was getting ready to kill his son. The Bible says he was getting ready to kill his son. The Bible says out from the thicket, here comes a ram in the bush. And God says, there you go, kill the ram, not your son. God was testing Abram's commitment to him. God was testing Abram's commitment to him. God says, I don't want you to put nobody before me. Nobody. Not your wife, not your spouse, not your children. God said, I need to know, am I number one? I need to know where do I fit in at? We ain't doing convenient ministry anymore. God said, we doing ministry with a sacrifice. How bad do you want it? We ain't gonna make it convenient. I'm gonna go to the church that's around the corner. But you'll go to work downtown. You'll go to work five or six, five or six, 56 miles away from you where you live. But you can't come across town. David understood this thing. He says, man, I don't want to kill my Saul because if I kill Saul prematurely, I'll miss it. And that's where Jonathan come in at. I'm getting ready to wrap this up. In chapter number 19, I'll finish this tomorrow. But this is what Jonathan come in in chapter number 19. The Bible says, Jonathan and David's friendship was challenged. Their friendship was challenged because Jonathan says, Saul, you're my daddy, but my relationship with David is greater than my relationship with you. He understood this, Jonathan understood this, that David got his necks in his mouth. Jonathan understood that. As royalty as David, Jonathan was, he understood that man, David, is my necks. Jonathan understood David is my next. 
Jonathan understood, I can't get to my next until it come from David. Some of you all have forfeited your date with destiny. Some of you were at the tip of your next, but you allowed distractions, locations, to cause you to come a setback. You allow what you call an excuse, but God says, I put that in your way to see how bad do you want it? How bad did you really want it? Or did you want it to your convenience? God says, I'm shaking comfort zones in this season. Jonathan understood this. David understood. Saul is trying to kill my best friend. He's trying to kill my soulmate. But he understood this. He says, not on my watch. He says, I'm not going to allow nobody, which includes my daddy, to kill my next. Let me stop. I'm coming back tomorrow. If you missed this, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do. All 27 of you all that are watching right now. All 27 of you all that are watching this right now. Terrence, thank you, man. I need you to, I need y'all to do this for me. Uh, Deborah, I need you to do this favor for me. I need all of y'all to do this for me right now. All 28 of you all, do this favor for me. When I count the three, I need for you all to press the share button. This word, this was a meaty lie. This was a prophetic lie. If ever there was a lie that you needed to share, this is it. When I count for three, I need everybody that are, that are watching this right. Don't log off. I need you to, again, your blessings is tied in your obedience. I know you may have shared it before, but when I count for three, I need you to share it again. One, thank you, Prophet Lonnie Davis, for this. One, two, three. Press the share button. After you share it, hit the likes. Hit the thumbs. After you share it again. Come on. I know you shared it before, but share it again. I know you shared it before. Share it again. Out of obedience. Share it again. After you shared it again, hit the likes. Come on, thank you, thank you. Come on, after you shared it, hit the likes. Come on. Man, if ever there was a live you needed to watch again, this is it. Could it be that the people that are in your circle season has come to an end? Could it be the people that are in your circle are hindering you from getting to your next? Or could it be that your non-submissiveness could be the reason why you're not getting to your next? God said the day of excuses are over with. God says, I need all of you. God says, I need all of you. Never ever allow your circumstances to dictate where God is trying to take you. Never ever allow your circumstances to dictate to you where God is getting ready to take you. And by the spirit of God, I hear God saying, five of you all are so close. God says, you're so close. You're so close. You're close. You're close. Darshay, you're close, says the Spirit of the living God. You're close. Jamar, you're close. I hear God saying you're close. You're close. You're so, you're so close that if you go to sleep, that by tomorrow, what you believe in God for can come to pass, Tasha. <laughs> oh my. Say that again. You're so close that what you believe in God for can come to pass by tomorrow. God says, I just need for you to recommit yourself to me. God says, things are about to happen. Things are about to happen. It's about to happen. It ain't the devil. It ain't your haters. It's not your enemies. It's you that's hindering you from getting to your next. But God says, I had to allow my prophet, Pastor Terrence, to come in and speak to you, to let you know, get back in the game. Rid yourself of excuses. Rid yourself of, 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 of legitimate excuses. What you have are legitimate. What you're, what you're going through is legitimate. But guess what? The woman with the issue of blood, she had a legitimate reason too, not to keep pressing. But she says, man, I'm going to press beyond my circumstances. I'm going to press beyond me going to the west side. My pastor's going to the west side. I'm rolling with him. Wherever he go, I'm Naomi. I mean, I'm Ruth. I'm Elijah, I'm rolling. The, the Bible says that the disciples went from town to town with Jesus because they understood that I can't get to my next until Jesus endow me. I can't get to my next until Jesus inject me. Stop using excuses and say, God, I want everything that you have for me. Not for the sake of getting what's in his hand. I don't want to serve God for the sake of getting what's in his hand. I want to serve God for the sake of because I love him. I want to serve God for the sake because I absolutely love him. Sister Weaver, if you are in the Chicagoland area, 
if you are in the Chicagoland area, I beseech you to meet me this coming Thursday, tomorrow, tomorrow. We got parking on both sides. It's secure. Don't let me come to the west side. Because I always say this. I always say this. This is what I say. If you can, if ACM, if we survive Inglewood, we can survive anywhere. If we can survive Inglewood, we can survive anywhere. Rid yourself of excuses. Stop using excuses. My grandma used to say, an excuse is nothing but a dressed up lie. Come out your comfort zone. Stop being, stop doing ministry conveniently. Stop doing ministry conveniently. Say, I'm going to press. If you're in Chicago, I beseech you to meet me at 1140. I mean, oh, dropping an old address. 1910 South Kedzie. 1910 South Kedzie. I got a prophetic word for the house tomorrow. I got a strong prophetic word for the house tomorrow. If you want this thing to drop, I dare you to meet Pastor Terrence tomorrow at 1910 South Kedzie at 7.30. Get, make up in your mind, I'm going to beat him there. Make up in your mind, I'm no longer going to say, uh, I, 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 I'm no longer going to use excuses. Thank you. I'm no longer going to use excuses. I'm going to do, do my part. I'm going to do what I've been called to do. If you say God has called you to you, God ain't bipolar. God don't change his mind. You and I do. Meet Pastor Terrence, Pastor Sabrina, along with another Chance of Ministries community. Meet us there tomorrow. How bad do you want it? This thing gonna drop. And if you need gas, now if you just if you need gas and want to be there, we got you. Now if you got gas and want and want to just be a, a just and just want to just take from us, then shame on you. But get there tomorrow. I promise you, the weight of God's glory is gonna drop. On Sunday, we saw a man who was born lame. We saw a man who was born lame, Brittany. He was born lame with a walker. I prophesied to him and told him he was going to walk. Right there in the midst of the service, Elder Michael Simmons, right there in the midst of the service, the man was born lame. He was born lame, shaking profusely. I told him God's getting ready to cause you to walk. And before service was over with, not only did he stand up straight without the shakes, but he began to walk. God says we are stepped into us. We have stepped into a season called miracles. There is absolutely not a miracle that you believe in God for that He won't perform. God said there's absolutely not a miracle that you believe in me for that I won't perform. God says I'm getting ready to perform miracles. Yes, I couldn't believe my ass too, Tasha. We saw God perform a miracle. It was all God. But again, you got to be in a place where miracles are being conducive. We ain't no longer talking about miracles. I want to see miracles. I told God, we were, we believe, we had, we had, it was a woman and I, God allowed me to prophesy on her. She was getting ready to have surgery. They was getting ready to have brain She had a tumor the size of a softball in her head. I prophesied and told, told her she was going to be healed. Not only was she going to be healed, but they, they, were, they was not going to have to have surgery on her. I prophesied that to her. And guess what? She did not have to have surgery. The doctor said, we know we, we don't see it. We, we, we need to reschedule this. I'm telling you about the spirit of God. Get into a place. Stop just going to church. It's time for miracle signs and wonders to happen. I want to be in a place where God drops it. And if you're serious about your date with destiny, you're already making your way to, to 1910 South Kedzie. If you want to be there tomorrow, just type in, I will be there. Come on. I just need you all to just to type in. Those of y'all that's going to be, beat me there tomorrow, just type in as an act of faith that says, I will be there. Come on. I just need those of y'all that's coming. Come on. Jamar, if you're in Chicago, get there, man. Get there. If you're going to be there as an act of faith, just type in, I will be there. Come on. If, if, if As an act of faith, I just need for you to type in, I will be there. If you're coming tomorrow. Thank you, Darshay. Come on. Come on. If you're going to be there, just type in, I will be there. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just type in, I will be there. Come on. I'm telling you, you want to be there. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Just type in. I will be there. Come on. Come on. Just type in. I will be there. 1910 South Kesey. 730. Come on. If you're going to be there. Come on. Just type in. I will be there. You want to be there tomorrow. I'm telling you all where we are. It's only a temporary situation. I will. Come on. Come on. Just type in. I will be there. Come on. If you're going to be there. I will be there. As a matter of fact. 
The ones that say they're going to be there, I'm telling you to bring somebody with you. Bring somebody with you. Because the oil of God is going to drop like never before. Brittany, if you're in, are you in Chicago, Brittany? If you're in Chicago, get there. If you need gas, we got you. Jamar, get there. I'm telling you all, bring somebody with you. The glory of the Lord is going to drop in that house tomorrow. I'm telling you what I know. I'm God's man. I'm telling you what I believe and what I know from God. God uses us. Don't try. Deborah, Deborah, don't try. Get there. I'm telling you, you need to get there. You need, VA, you're Virginia. Okay, glory to God. We'll have it live, hopefully. Get there. I'm telling you all, miracle signs and wonders are about to happen. It's about to happen. I decree and declare that this word does not fall on death here. I decree and declare that things are shifting. Things are changing. I will not allow nothing to keep me from my necks. I rid myself of excuses. And I thank you, God, that everything that God promised me, North Carolina, praise God. But just share it for me, Jamal. Jamar, I decree and declare that everything that God promised me, I'm getting ready to get. I decree and declare, I'm going to get it in this season. I decree and declare, I'm going to get them. Press, Brittany. If you're in Chicago, press. It's easy. It's easy, Brittany, to, 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 to watch online. But it's nothing like being in person. Florida's in the house. Praise God. Praise God. Those of y'all that have not shared it, share it again. Those that have not shared it, share it again. Somebody else needs to watch this again. This thing was oily. Glory to God. As the young people say, I love you all. I'll be back tomorrow. I'll be back tomorrow. Same time, hopefully. Same channel. Shekinah, need y'all there tomorrow. It's going to be a blessing. God's going to do something. You want to be a part of it. I'm out of here, y'all. Be blessed.